Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I'd been hoping for years to land the featured guest on my show today, so I am very excited about having Dr. Eugenie Scott on the show. Executive Director for the NCSE for almost 30 years, anthropologist, science communicator, one of the strongest and best and most articulate voices out there, I think, especially when it comes to scientific rebuttals to creationism and intelligent design. I've heard Dr. Scott speak at so many conferences out there on the road. I have read about her work as consultants in the Dover case, you know, the Kitzmiller versus Dover case back in 2005, which was kind of a referendum about whether or not schools should teach intelligent design. The Dover School Board wanted to cast doubts about the science, the fact of evolution, in the eyes of their students, and so it all went to court. Dr. Eugenie Scott, among others, consulted on the case, and the Dover School Board just lost spectacularly, and we saw a win for science and for education. I saw the interview with Dr. Scott. She took on Dr. Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute on MSNBC years ago. And, you know, he was just maddening. He was just kind of superior and pious. He was always interrupting. And Eugenie Scott was just so cool and even-handed. And she had an almost parental patience with the guy on live television, even as she was being constantly interrupted. I remember back in 2012, she won the Richard Dawkins Award. Just one year after it was given to the late Christopher Hitchens, who we lost in 2011. And I'm just a fan. If you are not familiar with Dr. Eugenie Scott up to this point, just check out the conversation you're about to hear. And I think you will be a fan as well. You know, as we fill our brains with knowledge today, let's talk for a second about the brain. What we think we know about the brain. You know, stuff we've heard for most of our lives. Speaking of intelligent design, many people say the brain's an impossibly complex computer. It could have only been purposefully designed. Bigger brains, well, those are smarter brains. We've heard that. We only use 10% of our brains at any one time. Is that true? Can we do brain exercises? You know, making ourselves smarter with brain calisthenics. Is the information age and all this technology actually making us dumber? Do our dreams have any real significance, or is it just kind of brain salad while we sleep? These are just a few of the many compelling questions explored by neuroscientist and educator Dr. Indre Viscontis, who I'm actually working to try to get on the radio show next year, early 2018, as a guest. But at the Great Courses Plus, she teaches a fantastic lecture called Brain Myths Exploded, Lessons from Neuroscience, tailor-made for this audience, because Dr. Viscontis is an atheist and a skeptic and a scientist and an expert on the brain. Brain Myths Exploded is just one of over 8,500 lectures at the Great Courses Plus on a ton of subjects, ranging from zoology to effective debate to photography to cooking to finance and economics and so much more. Stream or download from any laptop, computer, TV, or smartphone. Download the audio with their app. You can listen like a podcast. Watch, listen, and learn. I think you will love The Great Courses Plus as much as I do. And they're giving my listeners an entire month of unlimited access to all of their lectures for free. But you have to sign up through my special URL. So get started today. You will love it. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. On Tuesday of next week, the broadcast is about cops. We're going to talk about religion and law enforcement on a broadcast called To Protect and To Serve. 
I'm a fan of the men and women in law enforcement. I know they get a bad rap out there because there are some bad apples doing some very bad things. But I remain convinced that the vast majority of people who are out there serving us in police uniforms doing the work are good people. And they are talking next week, police officers themselves on the radio, talking about their experiences with religious influence in the police. We're going to talk about that. And then in two weeks, it's the secular jihadists from the Middle East and a show that's kind of Christmas themed. Yes, I have ex-Muslims on a Christmas show, and it's just awesome. So that's coming up two weeks from today. FYI, on the broadcast with Dr. Scott today, I know before the conversation she had said that uh, she's using a Skype microphone that runs on a battery, the battery running low. If you hear the quality or fidelity of her audio change a little bit at any point during the broadcast, it's because she switched microphones and it's not your system. So if you hear a little bit of a switch or a change at some point, it's all good. She just went from one microphone to another. And I certainly hope you enjoy the show and the conversation today. Dr. Eugenie Scott has a Ph.D. in biological anthropology. She was the executive director for the NCSE, the National Center for Science Education, for a long time, starting in 1986 until 2014. She served on the National Advisory Council of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. She's been featured all over the place, publications like the New York Times, Scientific American. She has participated in various debates. You may have seen her on MSNBC and possibly on Fox News if you watch Fox News, she's author of the book Evolution versus Creationism, an introduction. She's co-editor of the anthology Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. She's actually a superhero. She has X-ray and laser vision, which is attenuated to locate and eradicate BS out there in the ether. Dr. Eugenie Scott, thanks for being on the show. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here, Seth. Let's start with a definition, shall we? And maybe a few of the more commonly asked questions. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Most of the people here are literate in most of the rudimentary discussions about evolution. But let's just do our due diligence, okay? Can I start with what is a physical anthropologist? What is that? That is one of the subdivisions of anthropology, the others of which are linguistics, archaeology, cultural anthropology, and then the fourth is physical anthropology. We look at human beings and our primate relatives from the biological standpoint, as opposed to the historical like the archaeologists or the linguistic like the linguists. So we look at things like um, modern human variation. We look at things like human evolution. We look at, uh, there's a strong component of medical anthropology that has to do with the comparative approach of physical anthropology. So we're, we're kind of the biological wing of anthropology. It is uh, sometimes described as the most biological of the social sciences or the most social of the biological sciences. We straddle the biocultural interface. So what is your area of focus? What do you... And what resonates with you most? If I had to narrow it down, what would it be? Human evolution is what I'm most interested in within biological anthropology. But remember, I haven't worked as a biological anthropologist for close to 30 years. I mean, I used to be a, uh, a college professor. I taught biological anthropology or physical anthropology for a dozen years or so. But then I moved into nonprofit management and um, used my uh, academic background, if you will, to um, communicate science and to uh, help I hope, in many ways, um, to resolve this problem of the teaching of evolution in our country, which is so problematic. Let me role play for a second and I'll be, I don't know, Ken Ham. And I'll <laughs> say something like, well, come on, the NCSC, with which you were heavily associated for decades, you guys just want to kill God. You're all just in rebellion <laughs> and you're propagating the scientific conspiracy that is trying to eradicate the truth of creationism. You've heard this quite a bit, yeah? Well, if, if NCSC is out to kill God, that would come as a real surprise to a lot of my past and present board members and to an awful lot of our members who are uh, practicing uh, people of faith, um, uh, Christians, non-Christians. No, NCSC is interested in science. It's not 
interested in uh, stamping out religion. I mean, people are often surprised when I tell them that our best allies in keeping evolution in the public schools are members of the mainstream clergy who can go to a school board and testify that, no, they really want to have evolution taught Monday through Friday. They don't want public schools teaching creationism because what creation science or intelligent design or these various Iterations of creationism over the years are is, is really some aspect of biblical literalism that God sort of poofed everything into existence, and that is not the theology of Catholics and mainstream Protestants. So they don't want the kids to be taught somebody else's religion Monday through Friday and then have to straighten the kids out on Saturday and Sunday. Is this, though, the evolution of religion to stay relevant? We've gone from fundamental creationism to the more nebulous brand of intelligent design? Oh, man, if, if nothing else evolves, religion does. I mean, there's, you know, re- religion, pick any religion you want. It's had a history, and its uh, its tenets will have changed, regardless of whether it's one of the Middle Eastern monotheisms or a tribal religion or anything else. As far as the creationist movement, that is one of the best examples of um, adaptation through natural selection that I can think of. <laughs> because, yeah, you know, the history of the anti-evolution movement started with, um, uh, well, I suppose back in Darwin's day and, and the early 20th century with, you know, just evolution is wrong because it disagrees with the Bible. Of course, that didn't go very far in the United States, where we do have a First Amendment that, <laughs> until recently, who knows what about the future, but uh, it, until recently has been very important in keeping ideas like creationism out of the curriculum, because it is advocacy of religion, and, you know, the Establishment Clause is fairly firm about that. But the anti-evolution movement evolved from just, it's against the Bible to, well, it's actually an alternative science, and that's where creation science came in, in the 1960s and following. And when that failed in the courts, like I say, natural selection, intelligent design was cooked up as a way of trying to avoid the problems that creation science had, since creation science was much too obvious about it actually being creationism, which is a religious view. So intelligent design was was a more subtle approach, but eventually that also failed in the courts, I'm happy to say. Uh, and we had a little bit of, we, we gave that a little nudge ourselves at NCSE. And now, of course, the, uh, the creationism du jour is yet more subtle still. It's uh, uh, trying to persuade legislatures and school boards to require teachers to, well, go ahead and teach evolution, but teach it like it's really crappy science. Teach it like it has a lot of flaws and a lot, it's not really, you know, doubt is our product. It's not really a, um, a valid scientific theory. You don't really have to take it seriously, kids. So, yeah, um, if nothing else has evolved, creationism has evolved. So is this sort of a... Mutation, adaptation, survival of the fittest, right? Religion <clears throat> must change and adapt to its environment to survive, and the most fit religions have sort of stuck with us. Well, there's religions and then there's creationism, and we've, we've been talking about the evolution of both of these. I think it's extremely clear with the anti-evolution movement that we are dealing with adaptation to a, uh, an environment which is hostile, and that's the legal environment. And basically, when there's been really significant legal decisions against the anti-evolution movement, then creationism has adapted, shall we say, by becoming a more moderate and less obviously religious approach. Now, if you want to talk about the evolution of religion, I mean, religion... Uh, I know that my fellow non-believers sometimes find this very difficult to uh, accept, but, you know, from an anthropological standpoint, you don't have a cultural universal. You don't have something that occurs in every human society, past and present, that's ever been studied by scholars. You don't have a cultural universal unless it has adaptive value for the society. And there's a very large literature on the adaptive value of religion. It really does operate on a number of levels to encourage the survival and, and continuation of the societies which have it. Now, clearly, there's natural selection going on. If you have a religion <laughs> which says, we must kill off 
your male children. (laughs) That's an inadaptive (laughs) cultural trait. (laughs) That society's not going to, we don't hear about that one after a couple, after a generation or so. Uh, You know, and and to the degree that any religion, and I'm not talking about Christianity, I'm talking about, you know, some, any any religion in general, including tribal religions, as well as the the, uh, world religions, but any religion that has truly detrimental practices is going to either have to change those practices or, by definition, that society is not going to thrive. And I'm sure there have been societies that have gone out of business, so to speak, because their cultural practices were not, uh, were not adaptive. Talking here with Dr. Eugenie Scott, I had read that you came out of Christian science. Is that right? Very briefly, yeah. My mother and grandparent, my my mother and grandmother were Christian Science, but my mother was not a very religious person, and so she really didn't do a whole lot with our the the. We, I, there are four of us children in, in the family. She didn't do a lot with our religious education. My older sister took us dutifully to Christian Science churches and Sunday school until I was probably in about first or second grade or so, and then she started, she decided she didn't like Christian science, and since my mother wasn't taking us, she got to make the decision. So my older sister took us to um, a Congregationalist, which is a liberal Protestant denomination. So uh, I grew up in a Congregationalist uh, environment more so than in a Christian science environment. The only uh, lasting component of that was uh, that I never got any childhood inoculations. Of course, there weren't that many when I was a little kid. So the, quote, childhood diseases, which sounds like it's very innocuous, but, you know, some of these... These are not innocuous diseases. They can kill you. They can maim you. They can make you deaf. They can have some serious consequences. But I, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that mother had never gotten us inoculated um, until I was in college and I was getting ready to go to um, uh, Africa for a summer session, and uh, you know, the, the State Department required us to have all these shots, and I realized, oh. <laughs> I've never had any of these now, have I? Oh, that's right. My mother was Christian Science. So I had a couple of really sore arms for a couple of weeks. I was going to say, that's a lot of ground to cover in a very short (laughs) amount of time. (laughs) Given uh, your history, though, on the subject of vaccinations, do you support, like, mandatory, you know, by law, the vaccinating of young children? Where do you stand on vaccines? That is a really tough issue for me, to tell you the truth. I know this will come as a surprise to a lot of skeptics. Because I really do think that parents should have a lot of authority over the treatment of their children. On the other hand, you do have situations where, usually for religious, but sometimes for cultural and philosophical views, parents do withhold medical treatment from their children and the children die. So that's that's something that should not occur either. We need to have some sort of a balance. I think in terms of vaccination... I certainly support universal vaccination because you do need that herd immunity really for vaccinations to do their job and and protect society as a whole. When it is necessary to achieve that through legislation, then uh, reluctantly we have to do it. As it happens, um, I think there's a real, you know, data check that many of us concerned about science need to have about uh, vaccination. And that is that we see these newspaper articles about pockets of anti-vax enthusiasms, like uh, Marin County out here, where near close to where I live in California, and there's a couple of pockets in in other places. That's more of a new agey thing than a religious thing, by the way. But we we hear these news accounts about pockets of anti-vax fervor, and we get the feeling that there's some you know huge wave sweeping the country opposing vaccination, and it just isn't true. If you look at the actual data, the vast majority of people in every state are getting their kids vaccinated. They may get their kids vaccinated on a slightly slower schedule than what public health people would like. Um, but, you know, by the, by school age, anywhere from 93 to 96% of American kids are vaccinated which is, you know, within the herd immunity uh, uh, requirement. So, yeah, we should discourage the misinformation that's put out by the anti-vax people because we certainly don't want their movement to grow. But it's not like they're taking over. 
I mean, it's really a very tiny movement, and it has not had very much effect, at least as shown by the data, which shows that parents really are concerned and they are getting their kids vaccinated. The problems that we do see are probably exacerbated by sometimes credible-looking websites and social media posts, right? I mean, they look very scientific, often using the word science in their names. And as part of the NCSE and your own work, you probably had to combat a lot of these misinformation machines that are out there pitching ideas on the foundation of quote-unquote science, but they're not at all scientific. Yeah, it was funny. I, I did an interview with a high school student the other day, and um, he was asking about, you know, well, does the Internet help or, you know, or hinder? And and I had to laugh because, yeah, uh, if you put in creationism in a, a Google or whatever kind of search you use, the first <laughs> a very long list of creationist sites pops up. Oh, I always found that uh, creationist and uh, intelligent design sites always came up when I typed in evolution into a Google search engine. Answers in Genesis was always right. well up there in the Discovery yes. Institute and all these other sort of apologetics factories. It's yeah, just exactly. strategic. And yet at the same time, the internet, you know, giveth and taketh away, the internet also provides an extremely effective way to get out accurate information. When NCSC moved to using email and the internet in, in a big way in the early 1990s, you know, it seems strange that there was a time before the internet, but there was a time before the internet. And, uh, you know, it was extremely laborious before we really got on the internet. When someone would write and say, hey, I'm in a school district, I need some advice, you know, what what is this you know what is this creation science stuff? We would have to go to our files, put out a pull out a file, Xerox the file, put it in an envelope, address the envelope, stamp the envelope, uh, or actually very expensively fax it because faxes were extremely expensive back then. People don't realize that in the, in the bad old days. Now, of course, we just send the person a link, or we'll. Um, NCSC will have on its uh, website links that uh, you know we can direct people to, and, and it's just much, much more efficient. So we can get out information. People on our side of, of issues can get out information a lot more effectively with the Internet. And the people on the other side, too. You know, I mean, it's good, clean fun. It's just freedom of speech, right? We've been talking here about adaptation, survival of the fittest. Everybody always says, uh, oh, uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest. And actually, that's not a good way to think about natural selection. You ought to think about natural selection as the survival of the fit enough. Okay, so when we're dealing with people who are talking about adaptation, there are no positive mutations. Or if we are indeed a species where only the fittest survive, how do you explain this or how do you explain that? You want to speak to all that? The best way to explain this is that fitness is a relative term. Fitness is not an absolute term, which is why I was uh, encouraging people to think about survival of the fit enough, because if you say fittest in the uh, superlative EST version, people get the connotation of biggest, strongest, healthiest, most powerful, etc. And that's not what the biological concept of fitness is all about. The biological concept of fitness is about, can you survive and reproduce? Okay, you're fit. <laughs> now, there's relative fitness. There are organisms that are fitter, and that's true of prairie dogs or honeybees or, or, or uh, human beings. I mean, that's, you know, there are some that have more offspring than others over time. But, uh, you know, so, so really fit enough. If, if you are big and strong and smart and healthy, but you never have any children, I'm sorry, your fitness is zero. If you are small and weak and <laughs> tubercular and whatever, but you got five kids, your fitness is five times more than that person who is big and strong and healthy who doesn't reproduce at all. Okay, so fitness is a relative concept. It really, you know, the bottom line is reproduction. Do you get your genes into the next generation? And of course, we always think about human beings because we're selfish and we're human beings, and that's the species we're most interested in. But this is, you know, this is true of barnacles and prairie dogs and every other organism that's subject to, to evolution, which is everybody. I think a very common consideration that a lot of people have with humans is, um, uh, oh gosh, you know, we're helping all of these uh, unfit people, all these dumb people and these sick people. We're helping them to survive. And gee, look at all the babies they have. And we're just making the gene pool of human beings weaker and weaker. And this is a terrible thing. You know, the, the sort of eugenics kind of argument that people will often try to frame in, in a scientific context. 
don't worry. <laughs> Boy, we can't um, breed ourselves into a more stupid future. <laughs> I doubt <laughs> like it. My, my gag is always, you know, the gene pool needs chlorine. And it's always just a joke I throw out there whenever <laughs> I see something frustrating. But you're saying we shouldn't panic. Don't panic. Okay. I mean, uh, the the species as a whole is going to go on. We are very numerous. We are very diverse. And numbers and uh, genetic diversity is what matters when it comes to a species survival. We are all over the planet. Um, we're not localized in some tiny little group where it'd be easy for us to get wiped out. That actually was the case back in you know the various periods during the Pleistocene. The human species might very well have died out. We went through a couple of genetic bottlenecks that indicate that uh, our numbers were were very small. You know, maybe only a few thousand. But we don't have to worry about that anymore. There's a ton of us around. So, yeah, okay. I, I wear glasses, all right? And I, uh, my brother wears glasses and uh, my two sisters don't know that I think about it. Um, it could be that I have some genes where in the environment in which I was reared, which involved a lot of reading as a small child, that made me nearsighted, okay? But I've got glasses. I can correct that faulty vision. Uh, so my uh, vision, uh, ab possibly genetically related vision abnormality, is not really a detriment because I can correct it. More importantly, I had an appendectomy when I was 15. I'd have been dead if I'd been uh, an upper paleolithic uh, modern human. I mean, if I'd been a cro I wouldn't be here talking to you 60-plus um, years later. I'd have to take off my shoes to count exactly how many years that is, but there you go. Um, but we have <laughs> operations now that can correct a ruptured appendix and get rid of the gangrene and keep people alive. So any genes that I would have that would predispose me to appendix rupturing, uh, yes, I would pass those on to my offspring possibly, but they're not a detriment because we have medical care to correct that sort of thing. Same for people with diabetes and other conditions that under maybe hunter-gatherer conditions would not survive. Now, let's say we have a huge collapse of civilization. Uh, we have atomic war or some other horrible calamity that kills off lots and lots of people and destroys our medical system, destroys our agricultural system so we don't get regular food. You know, we just have a total collapse of civilization. Admit it. You read those dystopian novels just like I do. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> does. So what happens then? Well, the natural selection is going to operate differently on people. And people who have genes for flaky appendices or genes for crappy eyes, they're going to be selected against. There's no such thing as an absolute environment. The environment always changes, and natural selection depends on what environment you're in. In the environment I'm in, my weak eyes and my crummy appendix isn't a problem. I survived, I reproduced, my fitness is greater than one. In another environment, I'd be dead. My fitness would be zero. So you really have to consider the environment in which people are in and which an environment in which people might be in the future before you start getting all exercised about uh, are we increasing our genetic load by letting all these um, dumb and sick people survive and reproduce. The eugenic argument is never a very strong one when you come right back to biology. I have one more related question here before we jump into evolution and race, which is the focus of a recent presentation I saw you give in Orlando, which I thought was fascinating. But do you get into altruism? <clears throat> Why would we help those less fortunate, those weaker, those who, you know, on the surface, it doesn't seem like benefiting <laughs> them would benefit us. Do you get into those discussions? Oh, I can, because um, it's evolutionary biology. It's There's actually a quite... Uh, large literature on altruism and and uh, how it can be maintained in populations. You know, again, prairie dogs and badgers as well as humans. We are not the only altruistic creatures. In fact, I think altruism was first noticed in birds because they would give alarm calls, which would call attention of the predator to the bird giving the alarm and thus, you know, endangering the bird giving the alarm. But it was beneficial to the flock, which would then fly away and be less likely to get picked off. So the question was, well, you know, why do you get alarm calls in birds and other animals? So what is this is an altruistic behavior? One hypothesis, which was very popular for quite a while, was group selection, that there would be selection for alarm calls as a means of survival of the group. For a lot of reasons, that doesn't really work well genetically. But the, the, the going explanation these days 
is uh, not group selection, but actually good old-fashioned individual selection. Because when people really got down to the nitty-gritty of who are the birds in that flock that are getting the alarm call and who are the other prairie dogs in the prairie dog town who are hearing the alarm call from the prairie dog that alerts everybody before disappearing down his hole, um, you know, who, who, who are these people being saved? The majority tend to be those genetically related to the altruist. So the altruist is making an alarm call or doing something um, that endangers uh, the altruist's own life for the benefit of relatives. There's a very famous um, British biologist, geneticist from the 1930s and 40s, a real character named H.B.S. Haldane. If you really want to get some good, uh, good quips from science, just Google Haldane. But he once apparently figured out, you know, was having lunch with some people and literally took a napkin and started drawing on it and scribbling on it and announced after a couple minutes that he would be willing to give his life for two brothers or eight cousins. (laughs) <laughs> which is hysterically funny to biologists. They're on the floor laughing. They think this is terribly funny. You know, we have a funny sense of humor. But the idea being that his two brothers have, you know, his brothers each share half of his genes. So two brothers would be the equivalent of his genetic complement, so to speak. On the other hand, since you're, you only share one-eighth of your genes on average with your cousins, it would take eight cousins in order to, you know, to <laughs> reproduce his full complement of genes, shall we say, uh, uh, statistically speaking. This idea of altruism has become much more of a statistical concept. There are concepts called kin selection, which is what I was just describing, where the altruist performs an altruistic act for the benefit of kin because it is the genes of the altruists that are shared by kin that are getting to the next generation, not just the altruists' own genes with the altruists' own reproduction. So the idea that you can get selection for altruistic behaviors of related individuals makes a whole lot more sense for a variety of reasons than something like group selection does. That was a very long answer to your question. Uh, it's a good, fascinating answer, and I, I'm I'm <laughs> it's all cool in. Stuff. It's cool I'm guessing stuff. you're familiar then with uh, Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal. And, oh, he does uh, his such great work. Moral behavior in animals is a TED talk that he recently, well, I say recently, it's been years, but he gave it. There are videos of him demonstrating animals participating with each other to produce a common, positive, common result. It's fascinating stuff. It really is. And what's been really neat is that it's not just observational examples of these kinds of behaviors. There actually is experimental evidence as well. And and I think that's important. I think the observational data of either captive or wild primates is very, very suggestive. And I think it, it really gives you a lot of ideas for ways to approach this problem. But what's really neat is that there's actual experimental evidence where they, you know, they can c- control for various variables that may be interfering. And Yeah, it does appear as if the kinds of behaviors that are taking place really are very parallel to those that we formerly, uh, many of us, uh, considered only to be found in humans. You know, if you've had a a pet dog, (laughs) I think you already have an idea that that there's there's much more complicated emotional lives of animals than most people think. Goldfish, maybe not so much, but <laughs> so, social social mammals social man, mammals can be pretty uh, pretty impressive in their in their behavioral repertory, which you'd expect. You'd expect natural selection to work that way with social mammals. When I come back with Dr. Eugenie Scott, let's talk about racism and what does evolution have to say about racism. That and more on the other side of this. Okay, you want to see something slick? Right now, I mean right now, go to harrys.com slash thethinkingatheist. Okay, harrys.com slash thethinkingatheist and just check out Harry's custom and limited edition shaving sets. Just check them out. Not only have you just solved holiday gift buying for pretty much every guy on your list, 
You're giving something they will actually use and love. Harry sets come with German-engineered five-blade cartridges for a close, smooth, comfortable shave. Harry's foaming shave gel, special limited edition winter chrome and emerald green handles. You can personalize with engraving. They're delivered in these beautifully designed gift boxes. And the gift sets start at just $10. Over 3 million guys have switched to Harry's, including me, because I get a premium shave at a fantastic value. And as a special offer for my listeners, I have partnered with Harry's over the holidays to give you $5 off your order when you go to harrys.com slash thethinkingatheist. This holiday, give Harry's and give handsome. Get your holiday shopping done early and take advantage of free shipping. To get a limited edition holiday shave set while supplies last, go to harrys.com slash the thinking atheist right now. That's harrys.com slash the thinking atheist. If you are not a patron of this broadcast on Patreon, I'd be great to have you. It would be great to have your support if the show brings benefit to you and your life, if you enjoy seeing it pop up in your podcast feed every single week, if the guests and the contents and just the community that this show represents bring good stuff to your life, I would encourage you to become a patron. You get a special RSS feed so that you get a commercial-free version of the show. And then my patrons get a bonus broadcast that's just for them every single month. It's really awesome. You can just log on, check it out at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. And I continue my conversation now with my special guest, Dr. Eugenie Scott. Let's get into the heavy stuff for a few minutes. Has knowledge of... Who and what we are as evolved creatures. Has that made the idea of racism completely null and void? Well, racism, of course, is an ideology. And people will maintain or invent or cling to or reject ideologies independent of what science or reason or logic will tell us. Ideologies, which, as I mentioned in my talk, I don't consider to be a four-letter word. I mean, I think ideologies are very important. We all have them. There are benign ideologies and toxic ideologies. Racism, obviously, is one of the more toxic ones you can you can come up with. But ideologies appeal to values and emotions more, much more than they appeal to things like logic or reason or, or empirical evidence and science. That said, if you want to be a racist, you're going to have to look for support outside of science because racism is not supported by science. I can just say that flat out. If you understand the modern genetically based uh, concept of evolution, you will not find support for racist ideas like hierarchical ranking of human groups, of um, permanency of uh, of uh, biological traits through time and thus purity and and these other ideas that uh, that compose racist ideology. Unfortunately, uh, science tends to be seized by ideologues of of all kinds to bolster their positions because science is a very powerful cultural institution. And it makes a lot of sense for an ideologue to try to get science on his or her side. But if you understand genetics, if you understand evolution, there's no way that you can use, that you can legitimately use science to support racist ideology. Perhaps it's an oversimplification, but I think of the t-shirt, right? We are all Africans. I mean, do we go there? Is that sort of sum it all up or what? Um, yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, all modern human beings, um, based upon our, our current archaeology and paleoanthropology, all modern human beings are descended from populations that came out of Africa in, in, in at least two waves. That's fine, but that would certainly be very relevant in um, North America, where a lot of the racism is directed toward Africans and people of, of African descent. I'm not sure that it necessarily helps you with the uh, uh, Rohingya, 
I mean, you know, there, there's all kinds of racism around the world. And uh, I think trying to help people understand that we are all human is maybe a stronger and a more accurate message and more, <laughs> pardon the expression, obviously universal. Um, the thing is, the amount of differences between human geographic groups, racial groups, if you wish, is so tiny. The number of genes that distinguish, say, a person whose ancestors come from Europe versus a person whose ancestors come from Southeast Asia or Australia or Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of genes are just tiny. It's just a minuscule amount. of. There's so many more genes that we share in common. It's laughable to think that there is any biological foundation for this, these racist beliefs of purity and superiority and so forth. This would be news, of course, to the white supremacists parading through the streets, sort of sounding the drum of racial purity, racial superiority. Uh, I would support a DNA test or a genetic ancestry test for all of those involved. I just think that'd be awesome. I'm (laughs) sorry. Are those accurate? Um, Actually, there was a newspaper article that I saw that just tickled me to death about exactly that, about the um, uh, a group of white supremacists who, you know, very enthusiastically did one of these 23andMe or, you know, Ancestry.com or one of the other genetic uh, DNA tests. And <laughs> they were they were quite quite crushed that they weren't all Aryans. <laughs> now, how accurate are these tests? I mean, you, I've seen 23andMe and Ancestry.com, among a few others out there. Are they pretty reliable? I'm guessing you just get a, a rudimentary result back. They don't go, they don't give you a ton of detail, but I mean, is it worth doing? I did it. I think it's fun, but take it with a grain of salt. They're accurate in the sense that, yes, I'm sure that their uh, machinery that they use to process your DNA and chop it into little bits, I'm sure that you are getting an accurate representation of, of what's in your genome. But what that means is very much subject to interpretation, shall we say. What they would do is compare little snips of your DNA to snips of DNA of people in other parts of the world. And there are some snips of DNA that are unusual, that they're very rare. And so if there's a Central Asian snip of DNA that is very uncommon, but found almost entirely in Central Asian people, and you've got one of those snips, and you're someplace in North America, you know, if you're, uh, then that would be really interesting. And that might show that someplace in your ancestry, you have an ancestor who came from Central Asia. And that's kind of fun to know, you know, that, that that's kind of neat. There have been uh, lots of stories, uh, of course, you know, the I, I'm sure the vast majority of these genetic commercial genetic tests give people exactly what they expected. I mean, big surprise. My ancestors came from Scandinavia and Northern Europe. That did not come as a shock to me. <laughs> Can I ask you another evolution related question? So often when we see, especially in creationist circles, the ideas about evolution, they have this graph and it shows you know, the amoeba to the fish crawls up on land, and then it's the uh, chimpanzee or monkey and ape, and then a human being. This diagram depiction, this is totally wrong, right? Yeah, because what they're doing is using living animals as representations of ancient ancestors. You know, at some point, human beings are descended from creatures that moved uh, that, that lived in the water okay at some point in our history we and prairie dogs and squirrels and horses and dogs and cats and everybody else dinosaurs and the rest are descended from creatures that moved onto land it didn't look like those little drawings that they show you know at some point humans and um, uh, chimpanzees shared a common ancestor, but our ancestor did not look like modern chimpanzees. So one of the real misconceptions that is um, perpetrated by that kind of simplistic diagram is that living forms represent ancestral forms. And they really don't. Um, this This is kind of related to a very, very common question that I get and I'm sure you've heard it, you've probably gotten it too, Seth. And if man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or if they're really sophisticated, if man evolved from chimpanzees, why are there man evolved from apes? 
Uh, very few people in that biz know the difference between a monkey and an ape, but there you go. You, you take your advances where you can. But yeah, when most people hear the word ape, what they think of is modern day apes, chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans, uh, maybe gibbons if they really know their apes. They don't think of a common ancestor of humans and African apes. And they don't think of a common ancestor of African apes and the Asian ape. The problem with that simplistic diagram is that it assumes that living creatures like us or lions and tigers and bears and dinosaurs and mammoths and everything else are descended from creatures that look like other modern creatures. So they'll show a modern fish. Well, we are not descended from modern fish. We are descended from an ancestor of modern fish and the land vertebrates, but it, it did not look like that modern fish. And we are descended from a primate, but the primate that we're descended from didn't look like a modern day chimp. It looked like something that was, uh, you know, quite different from modern day chimps. Modern day chimps have been evolving since we shared a common ancestor as long as we have, and we shouldn't assume that the common ancestor looks like uh, they look like today. And of course, no, we are not you know, we are not descended from apes in the sense that people think of apes. We are not descended of, from monkeys in the sense of what people think of as monkeys, which is, you know, living monkeys. The old world and new world monkeys are living apes, so chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, whatever. We are descended from a common ancestor with apes. And further back, we and the apes are descended from a common ancestor with the monkeys. There's this idea that evolution consists of this march through the various groups of, of organisms, where really what evolution is, is the concept that we share common ancestors with all other forms, some more recently than others. We shared a common ancestor with barnacles a really, really long time ago, but at some point we shared a common ancestor with barnacles. I'm reminded of that uh, book. There's a PBS series based on it with paleontologist Neil Shubin called Your Inner Fish. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a really great book and it's a really good series. But if we go up to a proponent of ID and we say, well, you know, we are actually, we have an inner fish. I mean, it's so counterintuitive <laughs> that for many of the conversation stops. It just sounds so far-fetched, Dr. Scott. <laughs> Well, if you are really an intelligent design proponent, you probably wouldn't use that argument. That's an argument that's used much more by uh, more traditional uh, creationists, the, the one who believe God created specially. But uh, point being, the strength of Neil's book, Your Inner Fish, or the PBS documentary based on the book, the strength is showing the tremendous commonalities that we have in so many systems, in anatomical systems, biochemical systems, reproductive systems, that humans have with other vertebrates. And of course, fish are aquatic vertebrates. We are descended from land vertebrates. But, you know, aquatic vertebrates gave rise to land vertebrates, and it's amazing how much continuity there is. They don't have arms and legs like we do, and most of them don't have lungs, but there's just a heck of a lot of fish stuff that is retained in humans. Hey, I can do you one better, Seth. A good friend of mine uh, is a biochemist, uh, Bill Thwaites, one of the funniest guys I know, actually. And Bill once looked at me and just deadpanned, if you've seen one you carry out, you've seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> eukaryotes, of course, being cells that have uh, nuclei. And from a biochemist standpoint, yeah, you know, really, the eukaryotic organisms of which we and barnacles and uh, most other organisms that you're familiar with are all eukaryotes, biochemically, we're all dead ringers. We all use very, very similar um, uh, systems for generating energy, for utilizing energy and uh, cell division and so forth and so on. So, yeah, the, the, the beautiful thing about evolution is that it so well explains the similarities and dissimilarities among the various living forms around the, uh, on the planet Earth. And what you find when you really look closely, whether it's biochemistry or whether it's anatomy, whatever system you're looking at, is that there are some groups that are more similar than others. And the ones that are more similar 
shared a more recent common ancestor with one another than they shared with those which are more more dissimilar. And you can create this beautiful hierarchical branching relationship of living organisms if you do that. And by golly, what that lovely hierarchical diagram looks like is a genealogy tree. And what evolution is, is the genealogy of living things on Earth. Let's wrap up with... Some commentary about the culture. Lawrence Krauss wrote an article for The New Yorker last year titled Donald Trump's War on Science. He mentioned Betsy DeVos, the current U.S. Secretary of Education, and now she is sort of at a point position where she wants to promote an ideology, a religious ideology, to advance her words, advance God's kingdom. Your thoughts on Betsy DeVos? I, it's it staggers the mind that somebody that unqualified would be nominated to a cabinet position. This is a person who knows very, very little about the public education system, and she is responsible for the public education system in this country, at least from a, on a national level. Now, what's going to save us is that, by and large, education is a local phenomenon. It is a state and local district phenomenon, especially when it comes to things like curriculum, which evolution and the sort of things I'm interested in are. The good news is that the federal government can't screw it up too badly. The bad news is that the attitudes that are expressed at the federal level can act as real inspiration for firing up individuals who certainly stand on the opposite side of science education than I do, to go forth to their local school districts or their local boards of education or their local legislators, their state legislators, and try to get um, regulations or even laws passed that would severely affect negatively the public education system. We've already seen at NCSE, even during the Obama era, when when there was no encouragement for these ideas whatsoever, that every year there was a, you know, uh, any place from six to a dozen pieces of legislation submitted around the country to try to compromise the teaching of science. I can only expect that this is going to increase with the firing up of the base, so to speak, of uh, people who want to get religious views into the school. Does it make you want to just hop in the car and just, I mean, I'm going back to the (laughs) NCSC, right? I'm going back to the work. Screw this retirement business, right? Do you you ever feel that? Or are you you like, I've paid my dues kind of thing? Oh, no, no. I I have, look, Ann Reed is the current director of NCSC and the organization is in excellent hands. The the staff of NCSC will rise to the occasion. Uh, I have no, (laughs) no doubts whatsoever. This, you know, fear not, NCSC will do what it can, but it's a small organization. And if I can make a pitch to your uh, listeners, if you can support NCSC, please do so. They, they can do more with more financial uh, support. I mean, basically, NCSC has always been an organization that your dues and your donations pay for brains, uh, pay for people to go and do things that help science education in this country. So if your readers want to go to ncse.com, it would be just great. I will admit to you, when I was coming out of the faith, and this is relatively recently, it was Robert Moore's article that you have posted on the NCSE about Noah's Ark, the impossibility of, I mean, every aspect of it under the microscope, sort of, it just falls apart. And it's almost a comprehensive takedown of the biblical account of Noah's Ark. And that's just one of an, almost a countless number of resources at the NCSC website, right? Indeed. There's many, many uh, good refutations of the claims of special creation of everything. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that Moore's article was so helpful to you. Oh, it was huge. And it was one of the first sort of stepping stones into my dissection of biblical stories and biblical claims. I mean, it just really emboldened me to start asking questions about all the other stories, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 so good because he, you know, in a very... Um, in a very uh, matter-of-fact kind of tone, he says, well, you know, if then, if the ark 
were this big, then what would its seaworthiness be? Well, you find out that it's not very seaworthy. The thing would have sunk in a flash in any kind of rough seas. If the ark was, you know, this, then would you expect? So it's it's really a, a scientific analysis of this whole story. And there is a number of other resources like that on the ncsc.com website. Dr. Eugenie Scott, I tried not to fanboy too much during this conversation, <laughs> but I will say that, you know, you are... One of the people who has just been such a, I don't know, I, I'm such an admirer of you and your activism, your compassion for people, your good humor, but also just a strong, well-articulated voice, pro-science voice out there. You have changed lives. You've certainly improved my own journey as I sort of got late education on so many of these issues. And it's my honor. I'm just hugely honored to have you on the show and to have been able to speak to you for this time. It's been amazing for me and I hope for the audience as well. So thank you very, very much. Well, you are more than welcome. Thank you for asking me. Thanks for listening today. Back next Tuesday as we talk with law enforcement officers and the influence of religion in the police force on a show called To Protect and To Serve. I'll see you then. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.